Slater Crusaders, Happy New Year. Really glad you're here, but I hate to start off the year on this story. Um, I, I can't trust the media at all, really with anything, but particularly with what's going on right now as we speak in Iraq. Remember, we're just coming out of uh, killing Baghdadi, and the Washington Post called him an austere religious scholar. We already have the New York Times talking about these. At best, we'll call them protesters, and we'll get to this in a second, but we, we haven't called them uh, mourners, Iraqi mourners attacking our embassy right now. So I can't trust these guys at all uh, out of sheer bias, and at best, just ignorance, just, just reporters not knowing anything about what's going on there. So of all the people that we could talk to about this, the man I trust the most, who understands this not only as academically as well as anyone, but emotionally better than anyone, is Mark Geist, who is one of the heroes of Benghazi. Oz, how are you, brother? Good to talk to you. Hey, it's great being on. Thanks a lot, Mike. Thanks a lot, Mike. Man, I'm, as I said, I'm really, really excited to hear. So where to begin? I feel like we're going to bounce around, right, between what's going on in Iraq and, and your experience in, in, uh, in Benghazi. Let's start with what you understand in Iraq right now. Who are the players involved? Who, who, who do we need to understand, and what are their motivations? Well, you know, and uh, I've spent, during my contracting time, I spent probably six years in Iraq. Um, part of it was as a security advisor with Dr. Ayed Alawi, who was one of the former prime ministers of Iraq as well. Um, you know, it's, it's convoluted over there. The government has been infiltrated by the Iranian uh, supporters, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, you know, the militias that are backed by Iran. Um, Iraq, for the longest time, has been led by the Sunnis until after the war, and now it's the Shias. And I think there's a lot of the dichotomy that uh, causes the problem that's going on in Iraq right now, because they're really divided down those lines of Shia and Sunni. And traditionally, the Shia have been the larger population, but the Sunnis were put in charge for the longest of times. And now it's uh, the Sunnis, the Shias coming back in, uh, one, getting retribution for that, two, uh, Iran trying to push their uh, influence into that uh, government really heavy. Let, let's hit on that. So was Iran's role in the region as you see it and why and how they're getting involved with Iraqi politics? Well, I think a lot of it has to do, um, you know, if you go back to the first world, into World War One, when the lines were actually drawn in the sand in the Middle East of what was where, and that's where the separation of the Persian Empire, which was Iran, and you had the biggest uh, Sunni group, which was Saudi Arabia, and Iraq, or the Mesopotamia region, was kind of that buffer region, and that's why the Sunnis were put in charge from Western powers at that time. Um, you know, some of the players uh, you have there are the Kitab Hezbollah, which is the Hezbollah Brigade, is what it translates into, which is the uh, militia that was protesting, so to speak, uh, as you said, uh, warning and protesting against the U.S. Uh, involved there. And, and really, they are one of the smaller groups total, in, in, you know, in, in total population, trying to just push their power there. Uh, I, mean, I think the government was kind of supporting it in a roundabout way. So when you say the government, you mean the Iranian government? The Iranian government, for sure, and in a in a placid way, even the Iraqi government um, letting them do that because you know they're in a precarious situation as well. They have to balance themselves between America and Iran. Iran's their next door neighbor. They have a lot of trade that goes with them, so they're trying to balance that as well. Jeez. Okay. So what? Based on your understanding, what's what happened at least the first day of the protest? And what do you want to call these guys? Do you want to call them militants, protesters? <laughs> what do you think is a fair? Well, you know, um, and I, I'll call them protesters because, you know, they were, I guess maybe the right, I don't know if it's the right word, kind enough not to bring weapons. Um, you know, they didn't, they did it as a protest would be. I mean, they come in there, there's no weapons, there's no um and they came in during the day when a protest typically would happen, unlike okay. in Benghazi. You know, most of the protesters in Benghazi or the quasi-protesters were uh, 
armed with AK 47s, belt fed machine guns, and RPGs, and they came at 9, 10 o'clock at night. Um, wow. Okay. Get that's a, that's an important distinction. Okay. Yeah, that's really <laughs> important. Okay. So, what did these guys do? What did these protesters do to our embassy, let's say, uh, day one? Well, I think the whole thing started under the muse of a of mourning and of the, uh, um, and I don't mean any disrespect to them in that sense, but it's typical that they're going to gather their militia together, they're going to gather the supporters of the militia, and they, you know, as they're marching or as they're mourning the death of the 25 militants that were killed in the rocket attack after the attack on a U.S. Iraqi base where a contractor was killed, um, a private contractor was killed, that it was a U.S. citizen, and uh, several people were injured, I think even some U.S. military personnel. Well, wow. Okay, this is super. This is super. Important. So, first of all, let me cut you off there. Sorry, Mark. Yep. So, so this is so good. I love talking because I love how you went back to World War One, right? Like that's the beginning of the giant geopolitical analysis. But even in this micro analysis here, so when was that attack on that military base? That um, that was last was? week. That was last Jeez. week. Is okay. When that, when that happened, and we retaliated almost immediately. Wow. Okay. So we retaliated with. So 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 the attack was where exactly? Was it in Baghdad um, it was or Northern there? Iraq on a military base? It was an Iraqi military base that also had U.S. contractors and U.S. military personnel. Okay. So these uh, attackers killed one American. Um, there was a U.S. contractor, and there was. I don't remember exactly. I don't have the exact numbers on how many were injured and if how many were Iraqi or how many were U.S. service members. But I believe okay, so some of them were service attack. members that were injured. Okay, and that was an attack. That wasn't a protest gone wrong. That was an attack. No, that was so a rocket we attack. Okay, so we retaliated with airstrikes. What, what, what do you know about how that went down? Um, there were several different locations. I think there were some... Um, the um, Kitab Hezbollah has uh, facilities or I would say bases or strike points from in Syria as well as in northern Iraq. And okay. we retaliated against both of those. Was that an appropriate action in your belief? Yeah, I think you can't have anything but that. I mean, you know, the nice thing okay. about that is having a president and a and an administration that's willing to back uh, um, and take you know take those hard pushes to the groups that need to be taken um, and making those hard decisions. Got it. Okay, so but that's why the New York Times is spinning this as these guys are mourners because they're mourning the the loss of their twenty four whatever. Okay, yeah. so they come in and they're so they're protesting that. What did they do to our embassy? And have you been to this embassy? What is it? I mean, I understand it's ten times larger <laughs> than our embassy in, in uh, 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 Beijing, which is our third largest. It's like three yeah. times larger than our second one. It's massive. So can you yeah, describe this to acres. us and, and where they were? 100, geez, 100 football fields. Yeah, it's 100 acres. So wow. um, when I was in Iraq, that was when they were, initially I was in Iraq when they started building it and when they completed, um, it sits right along the river. Uh, I actually, you know, the picture that you have showing right here, across the street there's some apartment complexes, or at least there used to be. I haven't been there since 2010. So, okay. you know, some of my experience there is dated on that side, but there was apartment complexes across the street and most likely that's what this is being filmed from. Okay, any chance that protesters, let's just start with unarmed protesters, is there any chance that these guys could get inside of our embassy there? Well, they got into the green zone because the green zone currently is protected by Iraqi um, Okay either contractors or military or security forces. I guess I'll use that word, best way to describe them all. And from all accounts and all reports I've seen and read and people I've heard from that are over there is they just stepped aside and let them walk in to the green zone. Yeah. And um, I believe they came across the, what they call the hanging bridge, um, which is one of the other, there was a couple different entrances into the green zone. And they just came across, they come up the street, which, um, they had taken a left and then been right in front of the embassy. Okay. But once I'm sure the Americans were in charge of security, that's when it stopped? And, and what yeah. other security measures would have been there? Yeah, and you know, from the looks of things where they gained access, I guess you could say, to the embassy was the initial um, 
chicane or where you would in, initially come in as a visitor to the embassy. And there's okay. a guard shack there that is where you would probably check in first. Your name, if you were supposed to be there or not, would kind of get done. And that looks like that's where they uh, they were able to penetrate, I guess, that building and start it on fire from um, all accounts okay. I can tell so far. So what I'm, what I'm also hearing is this is totally different than your experience in Benghazi. Just oh, yeah. in forms of like size of infrastructure and protection and security and all that, right? Yeah, most definitely. Um, how many people, you can, when you were in Benghazi, the when you were in Benghazi the consulate how many people, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, how many, when you were in Benghazi, how many people were in charge of that consulate security versus today, now in Five. Iraq? <laughs> the, the consulate, and I, consulate, are, they also call it, called it a special mission facility. Um, in, a, in Benghazi was about eight acres, and it was protected by five, um, they call them DSS, it's diplomatic uh, diplomatic security services and uh there was five u.s diplomatic services um individuals and then there was four or five local nationals from one of the militias that were hired to be the qrf or quick reaction force wow, to protect the ambassador and, on eight and, acres and which we'll get to in the next segment no one sent to help you guys once attack oh yes yeah. yeah. attacks were made versus Trump's reaction to this right now. Actually, let's take yeah. a break right here and we'll get more to that. And I want to, Mark, I want to ask you when we get back about how, what you, how you believe the, the ambassadors and everyone, all the officials inside of this current embassy are feeling right now as you were in that uh, pretty close situation. Mark Geist, one of the heroes from Benghazi. We'll talk more with him coming up next. True story, Mike Slater, spread the word. Slater Crusaders, so glad you're here, and what a way to start the year, talking with one of the heroes from Benghazi, Mark Geist, uh, to give us insight on what's going on right now in Iraq, uh, in what I'm calling a similar situation, but as we've been talking about, there's obviously a lot of, of differences too. But, Mark, one of the similarities, I'm sure, is how the officials, the civilians, the ambassadors, must be feeling today. <laughs> now we're on day three of this attack. What do you think these guys are doing, like our, our American ambassadors and, and civilians, what are they doing and how are they feeling? Well, you know, um, the inside of the embassy there, I'm sure they've got some, uh, we call them safe rooms, um, hard points where they've got everybody backed up, um, you know, in a place, in a facility the size of the U.S. embassy there. And it's probably one of the most uh, secure and hardened facilities um, that we probably have in the world. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're feeling pretty safe there, I'm sure, because there's a lot of apparatuses in place. They've got a lot of security, a lot of layers of security that are uh, going to be between them and any potential attackers that would be coming over the walls or anything like that. Okay, that's good to and know. Compare that. I was going to compare that to the men and women who were in Benghazi that you were in charge of protecting. How are they feeling uh, at this point during that attack? Well, and, and to be, just to clarify, so I worked for the CIA when I was in Benghazi, and I was a security officer for them, um, which we were about a mile away from the consulate. The consulate personnel, you know, there was the ambassador and Sean Smith, um, both who uh, were killed in that attack on the uh, consulate there. Um, they had five diplomatic security officers. And the way that situation went down is they had been overrun before there was even um, a significant response or report of any attack. Uh, the attackers, I'm not even going to call them protesters, the attackers in Benghazi, um, overwhelmed the local nationals that were guarding the front gate, were able to push through, and <clears throat> basically there was little to no security other than the five diplomatic security officers who were there. Um, they got overwhelmed. They did what they were supposed to do and trained to do. They got the ambassador and Sean Smith into a safe room. Um, the difference between that and the embassy in Baghdad is uh, not only in size and scope, but the amount of money that had been put into it to protect U.S. citizens um, was minimal 
at best in Benghazi. And, you know, I, I can only imagine that uh, the amount of fear that they they felt. Um, I know when I heard the first uh, team leader of the DSS, the D Diplomatic Security Services, come over the radio and say that if we didn't, if help didn't get there immediately, they were all going to die with a few, you know, expletives in there as well. And you can hear the fear and panic in their voice. Um, and you knew they were in dire straits. Wow. Um, let's talk about the response from the government when you were in Benghazi. Uh, how would you characterize that initial response and then compare that to how you would characterize uh, the current response with uh, what's going on in Iraq? <laughs> When you use the word response, it almost uh, makes me chuckle a little bit because there was no response. Um, almost virtually, at least none that got there and was allowed to follow through. Uh, you know, our job over at the CIA base was not to protect the diplomats over at the uh, M or at the consulate. Um, our primary objective or our primary mission was to make sure that the 25 so or so Americans that were in our compound got home safe and uh but when you know and when we heard the attack had they'd been overrun um we had put out a call as well for any support that we could get and when that as i said when that team leader came over and i mean his words were if you don't get here now we are all gonna f and die and that's kind of what really the straw that kind of broke the camel's back in our team left and headed over to the to the consulate to uh, do what they can, assess the situation, and apply whatever force was necessary to make sure that uh, as many Americans over there didn't die as possible. I don't, I don't want to relitigate all of it, but it's relevant. Why why did they say the government at the time? Why did they say that they did not respond and back you guys up as quickly as should have? And why do you think they actually didn't respond and help you guys as quickly as they should have? Um, well, their their response was um, that they didn't have any assets that could get there in time. Um, that statement in itself is means that, you know, you could look into it from ne a nefarious side of that is that means that they knew when it was going to end. You know, um, I don't wow. think that's what happened. I think really what happened is uh, they didn't have the stomach to do what needed to be done. They were worried about the political ramifications of um, U.S. troops coming in and helping out and what that would look like on the national stage because the administration at the time was um, a little bit more um, touchy-feely with all these militias and the looks, and they wanted the, you know, they their hope was that the Iraqi, or the Iraqis, I'm sorry, the Libyans would be able to protect, you know, would be able to um assist and help protect our in our consulate uh the problem with that is the libyans at the time especially in benghazi there was literally no government facilities um almost at all there was no military that was there there was no police force i mean the police force that was there was a militia that went out and bought uh, police cars or bought cars painted them as police cars and used that uh, as a means of uh, extorting money out of the locals um, the whole part of Benghazi, eastern Libya, was controlled by various militias, and um, one of them was Abu or was uh, Abu Qatala, and that's the one that attacked um, our facility or our, the U.S. facility there. So the idea that we thought that our government thought that these guys would help you out—I mean, that's that's preposterous. They they couldn't have really have thought that, right? <sighs> You know, I, I don't think so either, but apparently, I mean, that's the best that I can, that's from everything that I know and have experienced there. Um, the other side of it, I think is mission creep. You know, I initially they got overran at the consulate. We were able to respond. We were able to, within an hour and a half, two hours, push the militia off that had attacked, you know, the 40 armed insurgents was able to, you know, um, eliminate a bunch of them and push the rest of them off the compound. And I'm sure, you know, my guess is that the administration at the time was like, okay, hey, it's we got it secure. Well, you don't really have it secure. You just have it handled for a moment. Um, yeah. Then there was a wow. counterattack at the consulate. That one was repelled by our guys. 
And that's when we got the diplomatic security service guys out of there. We were able to locate Sean Smith's body. Um, the one thing, one person we couldn't locate at that time was the ambassador. And, but we had to make the decision to either stay there and try to hold a undefensible position or fall back to our facility, which was about a mile away as the crow flies and reassess the situation and also reassess what support we may have coming our way. <laughs> Amazing. Compare, uh, we only got about, we got about four minutes. Um, okay. Compare that pathetic response, if I may, with what you understand President Trump has ordered in the last 72 hours in response to uh, Baghdad. Well, I, I mean, the response that he has had in the, within the first hour of the attack, um, if not sooner. I mean, um, he, you know, Secretary of State Pompeo has been given the authority to use any and all assets that are available to him to assist with uh, securing and protecting the U.S. citizens and the U.S. property at the embassy, which it is U.S. property, it's sovereign soil. Yep. Um, they immediately, um, they had the authority from the president to utilize whatever assets they needed. And what we saw was almost immediately 100 Marines were um, activated from various locations. They were on their way. My guess would be that that would be a fleet anti-terrorism security team, as well as the 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, which were um, in Kuwait. You're looking at another 750 Marines there that were up and ready to go almost immediately. And they were all, everything was put in place to start moving them that way. And <clears throat> obviously, uh, you know, with the situation as it is today and yesterday, um, the people, the protesters uh, took notice of that. Yeah. And now I'm also reading here that the 82nd Airborne, some, some of the guys from the 82nd Airborne have left. Were they in North, are they in North Carolina? Um, yeah, they're in North Carolina. I believe that's yeah, where so they're that, at, that's, out of North Carolina. Yeah, so that's pretty amazing too, right? So we're sending guys even from America over there. What role do you think all of these guys will have in the next couple weeks over there? And also, how do you think they're feeling being sent over? What, even, even, even the guys from, my, you know, who are in the area and also these guys who are in America right now being sent over. What are their emotions right now? I think they're, I mean, they're pumped up. They're proud of being able to go do what they're trained to do. I mean, their job is to protect Americans, protect American soil. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they are they are ready and raring to go. They're gonna get over there. They're gonna do their job. They're professionals. They've been trained to do this and they're gonna go in there and uh, and secure what is ours and make sure the world knows that, you know what? If you're gonna thumb your nose at America, we have a president that is willing to do what it needs to be done to protect American citizens abroad. Would you, I love that, would you recommend anything stronger than just a defensive reaction to this at this time? What would you, what would you advise the president to do? Well, I, I think he's doing everything that he can right now with, with the situation and the information that he has coming in. I mean, you've got uh, a battalion of Marines and everything that comes with a battalion of Marines. I mean, a Marine battalion, if they have their support elements that are coming in, you've got aircraft, you've got artillery, um, you've got mortars, heavy machine guns, light machine guns, and you know, you've got 750 of the strongest and best trained war fighters that, uh, you know, they just love to, uh, love to eat dirt and sweat and uh, protect America. Okay. I mean, and then again, you've got the 82nd coming in as, uh, you know, to help out if needed, or at least pre-deploy to, to an area where they can help out if necessary. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a response that everyone else is going to take a take a look at and be like, okay, hold on, we're not gonna we're not gonna push this any further. Love that. Uh, my last question for you, Mark. Um, haunts is a strong word. I don't I don't mean to do that, but what what do you think about still? How many years is it now? It's eight eight years. I'm seven, going eight on years. eight years. Yeah. What what do you think about the most about that time in Benghazi? You know, um, from a professional standpoint, most of what I think about is that uh, we now have at least an administration that's learned lessons from what past administrations have failed to do. 
and how to respond to these type of situations that, uh, you know, because we've got both civilians and military personnel, contractors on all of these bases um, that are serving around the world. And they need to know that they've got an administration that's going to come help them when they need help. I mean, they're out there putting their, their butts on the line. Um, my, um, my takeaway from that Benghazi experience, and I'm curious if, you're, if this matches yours, uh, it was the story of Americans being left behind. And we, we always say we never leave a man behind, and it felt like we were leaving men behind. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, I do. I think that is. You know, and, and, and part of that does uh, resonate with me. Um, you know, the other part of it that resonates with me is it shows, you know, because Benghazi to me is also a demonstration of what we have around the world. We have Americans serving rooftops every night that can come under fire and you've got uh, a, it's an example of when the cards are down and the chips are against you that you know Americans are going to never give up we refuse to lose and um, we're going to take care of our own whether we have the support from outside or not those that are on the ground are going to do what needs to be done to make sure that American lives are saved Man, and you exemplify that, Oz. So good to talk to you, brother. Hey, give me a minute here. Uh, tell us about your organization, and I want everyone to buy your book as well. But uh, how can we help you out? Um, you know, after Benghazi, uh, what me and my wife went through is private security contractors, you have a workman's comp policy. Um, the day I left Libya on September 12th, my pay, got, my pay stopped. I'm in the hospital for six to eight weeks trying to recover. Um, I've got to file all the paperwork to get a workman's comp claim. So you're going without money if you're injured or at least reduced amount of money. And if you don't have a savings built up, and you know most of us don't, um, you're gonna be struggling as a family. So to prevent that, uh, me and my wife started an organization called Shadow Warriors Project. And what we do is help private security contractors and their families as they go through uh, the healing, the heartache, and you know the, uh, the um, Remor the remorse that they have from losing a loved one or a loved one getting severely injured. And we just want to make sure that no one goes through what we did and that we take care of these families. Um, a lot of them you'll never hear about because they are contractors. We've had over 5,000 contractors killed in, since 2001 in the war on terror and probably close to 30,000 injured. Those are numbers that we don't talk about because that's why we have wow. private security contractors and we have contractors in general. So we're just out there to help them. Um, we have a website, it's called shadowwarriorsproject.org and you can uh, reach out to that. You can help us volunteers monetarily, just spreading the word, um, <clears throat> you know. Yeah. We uh, are always that. got and families that are helping and struggling, so we gotta help them out. And, and I love you and your wife um, always continuing to serve. Man, Mark, I appreciate you. And the book is 13 Hours, the inside account of what really happened in Benghazi. Obviously, you have to, uh, you have to buy that. Um, Mark, as this continues to unfold, can we talk again if, uh, if more things pop up about it? Yeah, definitely. Give me a call anytime. Let me know. Superb, man. Mark, appreciate you, brother. Thank you again for your hey. service. We'll talk with uh, Mark again. More coming up. True story. Mike Slater. Spread the word. Thank you, Mike. Hey, Slater Crusaders, welcome back. We're going to go from one uh, hero, story of one hero, Mark Geist, our last guest, to another one, uh, that church shooting in Texas, where two men were killed. Could have been dozens more. I'm not sure how many bullets this murderer had, but it could have been everyone in that church killed if it weren't for Jack Wilson. So we have video of this, and, and you see the murderer shoots one guy who, by the way, as he's being shot, he's pulling for his gun. And then the murderer kills another guy. And then Jack Wilson from, I don't, I don't know, has anyone calculated maybe 30 feet away, maybe longer, pulls out his gun and shoots the guy in the head with one shot. One shot. That is a stunningly miraculous shot. 
moving target, actual duress. And listen, if you've been to a gun range before, you, you, got, the, you got your ears on, so you, you can't even really fully understand, comprehend how loud these guns are. But if you're not expecting this, the gunshot's going off, you're feet away from someone who just got killed. So this is real duress, moving target, one shot, boom, gets him. Unbelievable, that is a nearly impossible shot. I remember a couple years ago, we talked to the gentleman who lived across the street from uh, the, another Texas church that was under attack, uh, Sutherland Springs, does that ring a bell? And this neighbor grabbed his gun and ran across the street, and he was able to shoot the attacker twice with some equally insane shots as well. 26 people died in that church shooting, and it's because there was no one inside that had a gun. It was a neighbor across the street who was able to put a stop to that, albeit too late. At this church in Texas, not only did Jack Wilson kill this guy, and again, that first person who was shot was pulling his gun, but six other people pulled the gun. Here's the video of this. Check this out. We were able to zoom in on, on different people who pulled their gun. So there's, that's Jack. There's another guy, pulls out his gun. There's your third. That number four right there. This is all, this is all within seconds. There's five. Right? So what, is, what do we got? <clears throat> so we got, we got at least eight people who had a gun in that church. And there were probably more who did not pull their gun because they saw that the situation was under control. Eight people! And here's the biggest point of all. <clears throat> it proved, well, two. Two points. These are arguments that uh, the left makes against us gun nuts all the time. First, guns don't kill people. You listen, <clears throat> you, everyone's heard that argument a million times. If you don't believe that argument after this story right here, after that video, if you don't believe this, then you'll never believe it. Guns don't kill people. All eight of those people had their guns on them throughout the entire service. It, they didn't have them locked away, unloaded, in a locked glove box in their car in the parking lot. It was on their hip. <clears throat> Loaded gun on their hip. And every Sunday, they have a loaded gun on their hip. And never once did those guns kill anyone. Never once <clears throat> did those, those guns go off. Never once was a bullet discharged from any one of those guns that those people carry to church every single Sunday. Not one time. That is an undeniable fact. You cannot deny that fact. The, the anti-gun people are so worried that the mere presence of a gun means that it's pretty likely people are going to get killed. Or if someone's holding a gun, then it somehow means that they're, they're inevitably going to turn into a homicidal maniac. Just, just holding a gun makes someone evil. Far from it. There, there were at least eight guns sitting in that church, and everyone was fine. So listen, again, if you, if you don't believe <clears throat> that truth based off this story and that video right there, then you'll never believe it. And, and that's sad for you because that's, uh, it's not a good posture to go through the rest of your life when facing undeniable evidence. Uh, you refuse to accept it. Second point here, uh, people against guns say that <clears throat> if we allow people to carry guns, uh, like teachers, for instance, right? There's a big debate about whether or not we should arm teachers. Uh, so if we allow people to carry guns, then if there is a mass shooting, then it's just going to be a barrage of bullets everywhere, just bullets flying all over the place, and then everyone's going to be killed in the crossfire. Right, so there's a mass, this is the, the liberal perception of this is like wild, wild west. Like someone pulls out a gun and then everyone else pulls out their gun and then bullets everywhere and everyone dies anyway. That's, that's their dystopian vision of what happens if you allow teachers to carry guns, for instance. This guy took one shot. Now, as I said, miraculous shot, <laughs> okay? So unlikely that that's how this would go down again, but let's say it took five shots or let's say two people ended up firing their guns at this guy. At least the shots are now going in the proper direction to keep people safe. 
The idea, and this is the argument from the left, from the anti-gun people, the idea that we can't let everyone carry a gun because there, there might be a barrage of bullets. What are you talking about? There's already a barrage of bullets. That's the point. There's the mass shooter. He, has, he is making a barrage of bullets, and they're all going in one direction. That's the problem. They're going in the direction against innocent people. So we need other people in there who can fight back and send a barrage the other way. And because of that, nearly every person in that church's life was saved. <clears throat> Amazing. So this, um, Texas just passed a law, or I should say a law just went into effect in September that allowed people to carry guns in churches. I'm not sure how that wasn't already allowed in Texas, or maybe there was some ambiguity to the law and it wasn't clearly uh, clarified, um, but you're now allowed to carry your gun in, in church. Uh, here is a video, uh, and that again just went into effect three months ago. Uh, here's Joe Biden speaking about that law when it went into effect. It is irrational, with all due respect to the governor of Texas, irrational what they're doing. On the very day you see a mass shooting, I guess the numbers now, I was on a plane the last two and a half hours, they got up to five killed, um, and we're talking about loosening access to uh, have guns, be able to take them into places of worship, store them in school. I mean, it's just absolutely irrational. It's totally irrational. Uh, you'll know one of the principles of the show is perhaps the opposite is true. So you hear a statement from anyone, and then you think, okay, hold on, perhaps the opposite is true. So Joe Biden said there that this law is irrational. All right, well, what was the opposite of that? Rational. Perhaps it's rational. Perhaps it's entirely 100% rational. And I believe that is indeed the truth. It is rational. So what do we do with this? Uh, two big takeaways from this shooting. Uh, beyond the obvious that we need more law-abiding people to carry guns. We need more sheepdogs amongst the wolves. Um, but point, the first point, these sheepdogs need to be prepared. You can't just say you want to protect people. You have to be trained and prepared emotionally and spiritually, mentally, physically, all of these ways you have to be prepared to do it. Anyone can say they want to stop a mass shooter or whatever, but you got to be really ready. Jack Wilson was a firearms instructor. He had his own shooting range on his property. He taught other people how to shoot. He taught people in his church how to shoot. He was ready, which is why he wasn't fumbling around uh, trying to find his gun. It's why he didn't, didn't hesitate on what to do. And it just shows that his brain, even again under duress, was able to stay calm and make that shot. It's unbelievable. This man is the pinnacle of preparedness. To keep the sheepdog analogy alive, this guy, he's the, he's the leader of the pack. So if you want to be a sheepdog, if you want to protect, you got to put the work in. You can't just say you want to do it. That's the first thing. Second lesson, and this is the one I want to, I want to focus on a little more in the next segment, but this murderer was known. He was known by the people in the church the pastor said, I've seen him, I, I've, I've visited him, I've given him food uh, in, the, in the times that he's been to our building. So he was known to people in the church. And this guy was also known to law enforcement. He's been arrested six times. He was 43, homeless, living in the streets. Uh, he and his brother, his younger brother, both lived on the streets for a long time. His brother killed himself in 2009. And Sunday was his birthday, was his, was his little brother's birthday. His ex-wife, <clears throat> in the restraining order, said that Keith is a violent, paranoid person with a long line of assault and batteries with and without firearms. That was in the restraining order. And his ex-wife just the other day said, uh, we knew he was crazy, but not like this. We, we, need, we need better mental health treatment. And we need to have a conversation in America. And this is so controversial. I don't know... I, I do know why. I do know why it's controversial, but it, it, it needs to not be. We need to have an honest, decent conversation about mental health institutions in America again. Now, I understand that this one homeless person doesn't speak for the actions of all homeless people everywhere, but it's not good for anyone to be homeless on the streets. You just spiral deeper and deeper into darkness, and it almost always ends in some violent behavior, whether it's against others or yourself. It's not good for anyone, but since deinstitutionalization, 
in the 50s, 60s, a little bit of the 70s. We think that the truly compassionate thing to do is to let people sleep on the streets. And it's clearly not. Uh, that's what I want to talk about more in the next segment here. Deinstitutionalization. We'll get to the roots of that so we can fully understand how, what potentially we can do moving forward. Until then, we need to thank Jack Wilson for saving dozens, if not hundreds, of lives. He is a sheepdog, prepared and ready. Here's his post after the shooting. <clears throat> I love this. I love this man's heart. He said, I just want to thank all who have sent their prayers and comments on the events of today. This is within the, the, this is the same day that this all happened. The events of church put me in a position that I would hope no one would have to be in. But evil exists, and I had to take out an active shooter in church. I'm thankful to God that I've been blessed with the ability and desire to serve him in the role of head of security at the church. I'm very sad in the loss of two dear friends and brothers in Christ, but evil does exist in the world, and I and other members are not going to allow evil to succeed. Please pray for all the members and their families in this time. Thanks for your prayers and your understanding. So here's a New Year's resolution for you. Be more like Jack. It's a true story. Mike Slater, more coming up. Spread the word. Hey, Slater Crusaders, welcome back. Um, I want to go a little deeper into this topic here because we're going to reference it a lot. Whenever I'm on Fox News, it seems, like 90% of the time, they ask me about homelessness and the situation with homelessness in, in California in particular. And we don't have enough time <laughs> in, on Fox and Friends and Fox News to go into detail about this. But it's really important to understand the background and the root cause of what we're seeing right now. Um, so I want to take a couple minutes here and talk about that background because we're going to keep referencing it uh, as the year goes on here. So my understanding of this all started with this clip from Dr. Drew. I think it was back in June, so about six months ago or so. <clears throat> and I want to play this because this was my turning point in understanding of all of this. So he, Dr. Drew at the time and still today, he was going on this kick about homelessness and how it's not, or excuse me, it is caused by mental illness and addiction not housing. So our governor in California, Newsom, and people on the left always talk about the cost of housing as the cause of homelessness. That's ridiculous. Expensive housing does not make people live on the streets. If we somehow lowered the average price of a house in San Diego, where I live, from 600000 to 500000 no homeless person is going to go now buy a house. Right? No homeless person is $100,000 away from, from putting that down payment on the house that they really wanted to get. No, no one on Skid Row is going to say, oh, thank goodness, housing prices went down $100,000. $100, I can now afford to go buy a house. I can now afford rent. Like, the cost of housing is its own problem, but it's a completely different issue with homelessness. So that's Dr. Drew's one of his whole things. So here's, he's talking a little more about it. We, we just absorbed a million illegal uh, undocumented immigrants without a home, without a country, without a job, without a penny. We absorbed them. They found a place to live. Hmm. It's a hoax. So it's a mental health crisis and addiction crisis, full on. So it is, it's Prop 47, Prop 57. So people came out of the prisons and people that had mental illness that shouldn't have been in prison in the first place, frankly, yeah. ended up on the streets. And then because we made drugs legal, essentially, in California, all my people are here. <laughs> my patients came by the tens of thousands. Wow. And so the, the drug users are here now because they don't, get, they don't get hassled. And if you're a drug addict and you know it's warm and you don't get hassled, and by the way, you can, you can steal and not even get hit for a misdemeanor, mm -hmm. you can steal $950 a day and not be hit for anything. Just get a ticket. How do you consider what is stealing $950? That That's sounds the, so specific. That, it's, the, it's new Prop 4757 laws, which is they took all these felonies and they made them misdemeanors, including stealing up to nearly $1,000 a day. Ah, I see. So if you have a habit of $1,000 a week, you're fine. You just steal a couple things or stand up front of the freeway and I you're good. So Prop 47 is a, a separate thing we'll talk about another day, but uh, it's true. People walk out with $950 worth of stuff in stores every day and no one says anything because it's basically illegal now. Um, so that's part one. Uh, here, so it talks more about the addiction part. So here's the key part of, of Dr. Drew's assessment on, on the addiction. Take this part. The other thing we can do is, is expand Lantern and Petrus. You know, we have this act that back in the 60s, 
when people need a treatment, they got treatment. It was called need for care. And right. That's it. They got care. Well, that, that resulted in some excesses, right? Psychiatry was doing lobotomies and thorazine and things. They, no, that's not going to happen anymore. But because of those excesses, we decided that need for care is no longer a criteria. Mm-hmm. You must be imminent harm to self or other. <clears throat> There's a giant distance there. Yeah. We could fill in with other things like difficulty meeting your medical needs, difficulty meeting your nutritional needs. You know, if you have areas where we can, if you had dementia and these things were happening to you and people didn't help you, you'd be inhuman. But because psychiatric illnesses cause the same symptoms, oh, you can't touch that. It's weird, right? Yeah. It's, it's really, it's a yeah. mess. All right, so this, this was, again, the turning point for me. He said it really fast there, but, but this is the key. He said, because of Langevin and Petrus. Did you hear that part? I said, wait, wait, what's that? What, because of what? So he's talking about the Lanterman Petrus Short Act. That's it, because of Lanterman and Petrus. It's the Lanterman Petrus Short Act. Lanterman was a California state assemblyman, and Petrus and Short were both uh, California state senators. They wrote a law <clears throat> that passed in 1967. Governor Ronald Reagan signed it. Here's the aspect that's most uh, relevant. There's a couple different parts of it, but <clears throat> uh, to end, <clears throat> excuse me, to end the inappropriate, indefinite, and involuntary commitment of mentally disordered persons, people with developmental disabilities, and persons impaired by chronic alcoholism. alcoholism. To end, and the key is the involuntary commitment. To end the involuntary commitment. So this is deinstitutionalization. We used to have mental hospitals in America, psychiatric beds, insane asylums, whatever you know, they used to be called. And, and you know the PC term is for today, whatever that is. But we went through this deinstitutionalization process of psych patients in the 50s, 60s, a little bit of 70s, mostly with good intentions. <clears throat> um, there were, as Dr. Drew mentioned there, horror stories, lobotomies and, and stuff like that. And I'm sure there are terrible conditions at certain hospitals. So we did this knee jerk, we gotta close them all down. And it's, it's like, whoa, that's, <laughs> That's a, like, that's a, we, we, the pendulum went from one extreme to the other. And like, oh, we gotta shut all these hospitals down and, and put all these people on the street. They're gonna, do, they're gonna do better in society anyway. If we reintroduce people into society, then, then they'll be healthier on their own. So maybe some good intentions, but here we are 60 years later, and now what? Now all these people are living on the street. It's not good for them, obviously. And we all end up paying for it, literally, anyway. So this is the former director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Okay? So this is 1984. He did a congressional testimony, and he was reflecting. So again, this is 1984. He was reflecting on his decision to deinstitutionalize people in the 60s. Okay? So he's got 20 years or so to think back on this, and here's what he said. He said, many of those patients who left the state hospitals never should have done so. We psych- uh, psychiatrists, we saw too much of the old snake pit. Those are the bad conditions. We saw too many people who shouldn't have been there, and we overreacted. The result, which we're really seeing today, <clears throat> is not what we intended. And perhaps we didn't ask the questions that should have been asked when developing a new concept. But psychiatrists are humans too, and we tried our damnedest. And he said the policies that they came up with in the 60s, 70s, were, were based partially on wishful thinking. That's not, um, <clears throat> that's not great. <laughs> based partially on, on wishful thinking. So in 1984, the New York Times wrote this article again about these congressional testimonies. Uh, I want to read one more quote here. This is Dr. Braceland. Dr. Braceland was the former president of the American Psychiatric Association. Again, these are top guys. Um, he was also a professor of psychi- uh, psychiatry at Yale University. So here's what he said. He said, oh, so this is about, this is, sorry, this is the New York Times talking about this doctor in 1984. In the thousands of pages before the congressional committees in the late 50s and early 60s when they were debating deinstitutionalization, little doubt was expressed about the wisdom of deinstitutionalization. Little doubt. And the development of tranquilizing drugs was regarded, regarded as an unqualified godsend as one of the nation's leading psychiatrists, Dr. Braceland described it when he testified before a Senate subcommittee in 1963. So these guys regretted it, not, not too far away. So 
on the spectrum of reasons to put someone in a mental hospital, it went from need for care, which was maybe too low of a bar, right? Maybe a little too vague, a little too lax, a little too all-encompassing, to this other extreme, which is imminent harm to self or others. And as Dr. Drew said, there's a, there's a giant gap in between here that we need to have a conversation about, about what, what this looks like. I totally understand the libertarian argument against forced hospitalization, the civil rights, I get that. I understand that the Soviet Union used this against political opponents saying, you're crazy, we're gonna throw you in a sane asylum. I understand the abuses, but we, can, we have to have a conversation about this giant middle ground here because letting people who are addicted and mentally ill wallow on the streets is not helping anyone. And ultimately, you're gonna get people like this murderer in Texas who spirals down into such a place that they end up shooting a church after getting arrested, arrested six times, and then we just put him back on the streets. How can, you, how can anyone possibly think that this is acceptable? So while the pendulum was probably too far in one direction 50 years ago, we've now swung it way too far in the other direction. And we're gonna talk a lot more in the future about how we can find the proper trade-offs that's best for everyone. Really important conversation, and we're gonna have it. True story, Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Cider Crusaders, uh, we're gonna wrap up here with some general thoughts on uh, 2020 uh, election coming up here. Uh, every sign points to Donald Trump winning the 2020 election. But if he does, it's going to feel very different than election night 2016. When Trump won in 2016, it was amazing. It, I, like, I, it was, what, what's going on? This is awesome, are you kidding me? And you're just like sticking it to the media. I watch still, still I watch videos from election night, the election night montages from CNN and MSNBC. They're hilarious. And all the memes of Hillary supporters crying in the streets. It's awesome. So I, I'm still celebrating just the entire 2016-ness. That, like, that day was unbelievable. But when Trump wins in 2020, it's going to be very different. Uh, it's going to be very different. The closest I can, I can liken it to is, have you seen the, uh, the HBO miniseries John Adams? If you haven't watched it, you need to. Gosh, it's old now. Um, but once our founding fathers voted for independence, You'd think they'd be excited. Like, you'd think they'd uh, like, high five each other. I don't know if George Washington was big on the high five, but like you would have think that they'd, they'd be elated and jumping up and down or excited or smile, but they weren't. They were silent and they, they just looked at each other because they knew the severity of what they just did. They understood deeply what was now ahead of them. And, and I feel like it's going to be the same. And I know some progressives are going to be like, oh, Slater compared Trump to George Washington. <laughs> it's going to be the same thing when Trump wins again. And I, I just I anticipate me saying, okay, here we go. <laughs> here's, here's the next four years. It's going to get worse. It's going to get, it's going to get worse. Because as the media still makes it out to seem, certainly did in 2016 and will do even more, but Trump's the worst person on the planet. Do you remember 2016? Like, it was this whole, like, we can't let him near the nuclear codes. Do you remember all that talk? And his supporters are, in, are gonna be emboldened. And in 2020, all oh, his supporters are gonna be even more emboldened to do terrible things. You know, like, like all those, those attacks that Trump supporters did in the last three years. You, you, you know, all the... Well, you know them all. You know all the times that the MAGA hat wearers attacked. I don't either. I don't remember. I remember MAGA hat wearers being attacked, but I don't, I don't remember any, any Trump supporters doing the attacking, even though that's what the left's been freaking out about for the last three years. I do remember in 2017, the guy who went to the Republican baseball practice and almost shot and killed 24 Republican senators could you imagine if that, the police officers weren't there? And they were only there because Steve Scalise was the majority whip um, at the time. It would have been a massacre of Republican senators. That was two and a half years ago. That wasn't that long ago. And, and uh, the, the governor, the, uh, not governor, the, um, the uh, attorney general at the time said the act was fueled by rage against Republican legislators. 
So I wonder why that story never gets mentioned anymore, right? Because it has to be the Trump supporters who are the violent ones. But even Trump himself, has Trump done, in three years, has he done anything dangerous? Anything insane, anything terrible and awful? I'm talking to progressives, I'm asking progressives. People who were so scared in 2016 that, that I'm serious, sought clinical psychiatric help, fearing that he'd round everyone up in internment camps. I'm talking to you, if you believe that, has he done anything remotely close to that in the last three years? The closest you can say, maybe the first thing is like, oh, kids in cages at the border. That was all happening under Obama, and Trump changed the policy on family separation. So you got nothing. So the fear of Trump the last four years has been completely unfounded, and their concern for the next four years when he wins again is gonna be equally unfounded. But it's gonna be even crazier. They're gonna freak out a thousand times more. The wild card really is how the left will react to Trump winning, not how the right will. Let me play this clip. This is Michael Moore just the other day. By the way, Michael Moore predicted Trump's winning maybe, maybe earlier than anyone. So here's Michael Moore the other day. Two thirds of all white guys voted for Trump. That means anytime you see three white guys walking at you down the street toward you, two of them voted for Trump. You need to move over to the other sidewalk because these are not good people yeah. that are walking towards you. You should be afraid of them. So we're gonna have four more years of the left being afraid of you. What will they do in fear if Trump wins again? How will they, in their completely unfounded fear of you, what, how, what will that fear, how will that fear cause them to act? Honestly, if there was an objective observer, they would be way more concerned about how the progressives living in fear of two-thirds of white people, how they would act, than they would have concern about how those two-thirds of white people will act. Okay, we got a lot, there's a lot there. We gotta wrap up the show. I bring all this up because this election, every sign is pointing to Trump to win, but all of that could change the day before the election with some war, some terrorist attack. Well, this brings it back around to what's going on in the embassy right now. We kicked off the show with Mark Geist, one of the heroes from Benghazi. Trump could have a 100% chance of winning, and then at the last moment, there's a terrorist attack, and the entire board changes. Or let's say Trump orders an attack, like he did with al-Baghdadi a few months ago, but instead of it going perfectly for the Americans, a bunch of Navy SEALs get killed. Right, this, um, the Baghdadi attack, no Americans were killed, it's a miracle. But what if in that same attack, some IED was sitting around the corner and all the special forces guys died and Baghdadi got away? That would be a very different news story today. What if we get in some war with Iran over what's going on in Baghdad right now and a couple of helicopters crash and Americans die? The media will never let that go. And every single day they're gonna beat the drum of Trump being an incompetent and dangerous commander in chief. My point is, be careful of 2020 predictions because everything could be headed down a certain path and then all of a sudden in an instant, the entire game changes. In the meantime, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad we're doing this together. It's gonna be a fun year. True story with Mike Slater. We'll be back tomorrow. Spread the word.